This episode of the 12 Monkeys Podcast is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. Welcome to the 12 Monkeys Podcast, a Southgate Media Group production, where we talk all about Sci Fi Channel's reimagining of the classic science fiction film originally produced by Terry Gilliam and now produced for television by Terry Metalis. I'm your host, Blair Knight Graves, executive producer of Professional Geek Podcast, and with me today is Kyle Tremblay, the editor in chief at TVBinges.com. You can find us on Twitter at Blair Loves TV and at Kyle Loves TV. And remember, both Kyle and Blair have an E at the end. And you can follow this podcast's Twitter handle, at 12MonkeysPod. Hey, Kyle, how are you doing today? Oh, Blair, I'm just happy that I didn't arrive at this podcast as some kind of deformed, horrible human monster <laughs> through the time portal. Yes, a very dead space looking creature oh. for anybody, anybody who's into the video games. Yeah, it, it was, uh, <laughs> that was, that was some intense stuff. I, I, I said it was like Silent Hill. Oh, um, yes, Silent Hill is a good reference to Very too. Silent very- Hill. Yes. <laughs> Which I tweeted before you made that Dead Space reference. Our mind is just video games. Yes, exactly. All, all of our points of reference are video games. <laughs> exactly. All video games from like the mid-2000s. Yes. Um, well, Kyle, today you and I are going to be discussing Season 2, Episode 6. Which, oh, no. It is not Episode 6. It's nope. Episode 7. Oh. Season 2, Episode 7. You, you might uh, say that time just flew by. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 And the podcast is over. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We're not making any more. Oh, no, we're kidding. Um, so season two, episode seven, which is titled Meltdown, um, which I was not able to get the written by, but it was directed by Grant Harvey, who was a producer and director for some of my favorite horror movies, which are the Ginger Snaps movies. Oh. Um, they are Canadian horror movies about teenage girls becoming werewolves and they are magnificent films. Mm. So um, it's very cool to see that he hopped on an episode. Like, this is his only episode of 12 Monkeys that he hopped on because he was like, you know what? This is very horrific. I will do this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so- I mean, we've been talking now for a while this season about how the show is sort of embracing the horror elements a little bit. And it's never been clearer than here. This was – the first half of this episode specifically – was really like a horror movie. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, we had plague doctors. We had dudes that were yeah. disemboweled. <laughs> I, all kinds well, of I love that stuff. That's all. That's that's right up my alley for all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> very very Kyle stuff. Yes. Um, no, yeah, I'm very much all about the plague doctors and things like that. And you know what? Even though I was being a little bit silly uh, on, on our episode last week uh, about how I was struggling with the more supernatural elements and I was looking for more sci-fi. This kind of made me totally ease into the supernatural elements and I'm fine. <laughs> like, well, first of all, I'm glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> but also, I knew you'd like this episode after I watched it. We, we, we haven't talked until now, but I knew you'd like it because – it got rid of a lot of these sort of plot mechanics that were not got rid of, but it it, it put aside, set aside for a week, a lot of the, the stuff that's been introduced this season about these sort of specifics of, of the plot. There, there were no primaries in this episode. Mm-hmm. It was sort of the this, – this in a lot of ways I think if we look back on the season is going to feel like a bridge episode between what happened before with these sort of time travel adventures back to specific times to uh, – to try to prevent primaries from being paradoxed and whatever the rest of the season is going to be. Um, I, I think that this, this in a lot of ways put a bow on that primary stuff. The, the sort of idea of like the, the purpose here is to go back and rescue primaries. I think that we are now moving on. And this episode really, to me, felt very much like a season one episode with, um, with, a, with just the way that everything took place in like a very confined space. Yes, I totally agree. Um, the, the, well, this is, would you call this a bottle episode? No, only because 12 Monkeys does this a lot. There's been a lot okay. of episodes like this. I mean, in the show's okay. run, there, there's been at least, what, three or four, maybe more, that have taken place entirely inside the lab. For uh, for a different show, it would be. I could definitely see that distinction. But for 12 Monkeys, I think that just the sort of nature of the show, um, it's, but, it's a little bit too common for... Yeah, but the nature of the episode... in terms of 
a very, very specific moment in time that this is all occurring. And this is very much like a real time episode, uh, which I think is what is always wonderful about bottle episodes is that mm-hmm. you're, you're sort of following the characters as immediately as they experience something. Um, and, and then just the general expediency and the, the, the way that they're all rushing around. I don't know. Uh, it's not a bottle episode, as you said, but it, it was, a, it was very, uh, claustrophobic. Yes. Um, even though it's a space that we are very <laughs> intimately familiar with, this is probably the most claustrophobic that 12 monkeys has ever felt. And it just was phenomenal to, to experience sort of the horror in your own home, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it was, they, they really achieved something magnificent with meltdown. I'm just, I'm just very happy. All I'm just going to say is this is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I, I will say uh, this, this episode, I'm going to be the slightly grumpy one, although I very much enjoyed the episode but um what i'll point out is that this is like the 95th time that the time machine has malfunctioned <laughs> like, like i feel like this episode would have been a little bit more impressive um had we not gone to that well so many times where like mm-hmm. something is wrong with the time machine <laughs> like i feel like we've seen that a lot from this show <laughs> and, and so i you know even though this time it's a little bit of twist on it because the witness was you know, the witness was, I think, involved via Cassie in uh, causing this. And it was a different a different nature of the malfunction. It was more like it was sabotaged as opposed to just like a technical problem. But right. all in all, like the story of the time machine breaking down in some way, this is a, like like at least a quarter of the show's episodes have been devoted to that or had that as a, a B or C story. So, you know, I, I, I'm... I guess my one criticism, which I'll get out of the way up front, and again, I enjoyed the episode, but my one criticism is that I never felt for a second that there were stakes in terms of the, like, I didn't buy into um, that anything could actually happen in the lab in this episode. Like, it didn't, it, it, there was never a feel like, okay, the, the, the paradigms of this show are about to change because the lab is about to be destroyed. Like, it, it never felt like a monumental episode. It felt more like, I mean, it felt closer to a bottle episode where where nothing, like, really changes, but you do a lot of character work, and you sort of learn more about your characters, and, and in this case, kill off one or possibly more fringe characters, but not, you know, it, it, it just, it never felt like, to me, like, this was, a sh- this was an ep- episode that was going to... Um, cash in the stakes that it sort of established for itself which is not like i mean that's like sort of par for the course for tv like in like it like in law and order you don't expect like someone like any, anything about the, the the paradigms of the show to change based on any episode no matter how threatened any one person is but you know i just i i will say like i never i never felt tense in a big picture sense like we were with like like maybe like the sense that i had when the when the plague was being wiped out earlier this season that really felt like a major shift in the show itself and i never got a sense like that was ever going to happen and it ended up not happening here but no but three characters were removed from the story in this episode well let's go over the three characters (laughs) okay because there's the guy that was introduced what four episodes ago michael hogan colonel ty from battlestar galactica yeah David Eklund, who yeah. my heart goes out to, look at him with his sacrifice of love. It was a great <laughs> sacrifice. No one's taken away the sacrifice. That character existed to die. No, that was a character yeah. that 100%, nobody is that nice, laid back, and funny in a show like this unless their sole purpose is to die. <laughs> You cannot possibly have a character of that nature who is that good natured who is not going to die. He's a pacifist. <laughs> yeah, pacifist. Top yeah. it all off. He's a he, pacifist. He was donezo <laughs> from the second he stepped on screen. <laughs> so not a big surprise. Um, I think the other uh, second character would be Ramsey's son, Sam, who I don't think has been taken off the board even remotely. Uh sure. For a couple episodes, probably, maybe even through... I think for not a single episode. Because, spoiler alert, I think he's the witness. I was thinking he was the witness. He's the witness, right? But somebody somebody reached out to grab his hand Yeah, I think it might be, like, older him. It might be, like, who knows? I mean... It's a paradox. Yeah, but who who knows? It's the Red Forest. I mean, do do paradoxes exist? I don't know. I don't know, honestly, but... It could be any. It could be one of the army of the twelve monkeys, like generals, lieutenants, whatever. It could have been the pallid man. It could have. I, I have a. I have, of witness. 
I, so I agree. I think he is the witness, but I do have one thought as to why he might not be. Let's hear it. Uh, Cassie very or Cassie being controlled by the witness very clearly was willing to kill that child. Ah, uh, was she? <laughs> I think so. Did she? I mean, she could have killed them any time. No, uh, yeah, but I think that you know it was either the thing was going to explode or she was going to kill the child. Didn't she? Uh, didn't she kind of? I mean, okay. So if we're if we're taking this, let, let's let's operate from the premise that uh, that he is the witness at this point. He doesn't know that he is, but but the witness knows that. The witness knows that uh, that Sam is the witness in his younger self. <laughs> For <laughs> operating for that premise, the idea would be that he needs this chain of events to occur for um for for for, for what reason? For he, he, he would he would have needed everything to happen as it happened for some reason. Um mm-hmm. I don't know what that reason is specifically. Um maybe it was I mean may, maybe the fact that uh they had to he, he had to ha- do something to get Cassie out of – to get himself out of Cassie's body. Like I don't know the mechanics. I think we don't know enough about to conclude anything. Like pl- I, don't, I don't think the pieces are there to, for the puzzle to be assembled right now. I don't <laughs> think that they put the pieces on the board. But what I do know and tweeted is that kid is, is seven times too smart for how old he is. <laughs> Which is a problem. I, I I actually tweeted like I don't trust this kid for one second. He has an IQ of one ninety seven. Like <laughs> like if you make a kid that smart, which is a TV trope, but you can't. They've got some kind of devious plans for him. He cannot be that smart. And then of course the model that he created. Ha- I don't think that the purpose of that whole of him having an intimate knowledge of the entire facility. I don't think the purpose of that was for that one scene where he points down to the river below. I think that there is a much greater purpose <laughs> to that that may involve the uh, the little map that that Jennifer looked at a few episodes back um, that seemed to uh, uh, involve the facility itself, like the, the the one made by the witness. Right. Yeah, I'll buy into it. I'll buy into it. I, I mean, I I pretty much am on board that team witness is Sam but yeah. I uh there's still a part of me that the only part that's unconvinced is the fact that he, that he was willing to hold a gun to himself pretty readily I, uh, yeah um, but I, and I, also yeah if, you know, and also like I don't understand paradoxes fully yet and if the witness is in Cassie's head and holding on to him as a child does that also count as the witness touching the witness like I don't know how consciousness is versus a physical thing uh in terms of causing paradoxes but I, I have questions. <laughs> yeah, well, and in in this episode, I mean, Jones sort of threw out the idea of like, what was it, like mental time travel or something, like some kind of yeah. weird. Yeah. That, so we, I mean, we, we we could really get into the weeds on this, but I just don't think the pieces are there right now. I think that this is the start of the plot that will sort of unravel of that. But I will say that I think there are a thousand great descri- great ways to um, explain why Cassie being controlled by the witness had a gun to the potential witness's head as a child. I think that are, that's a very easy plot point to explain with, with a variety of, of, of reasons. Um, and the other paradox thing, I mean, I don't know I, that we just don't know how paradoxes work fully. You know, right. we, we, I mean, we've never seen this whole, this whole, as I had called it last week, this whole warging thing <laughs> where, where the witness could warg into Cassie. Um, uh, I, I don't think that we have any context for understanding what that is or what the witness is doing. So who knows? You know, who knows? But it just – the context clues in this episode made me really think that <laughs> Sam is the witness. Just the, the the way that he had all this dialogue, the, the, the fact that he speaks as if he's like a grad student – um, the, the, the incredibly detailed map of, or a scale, like scale model of the, uh, the entire time travel facility it just seems like this is all like, like Anakin Skywalker behavior. Like this is all like pre Darth Vader stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. I can buy into it. I can buy into it. Um, so then our third person who has left is our, our, our beloved Ramsey, Jose Ramsey. Yeah. Now, what happened with Ramsey? Because I don't even. I don't even. He grabbed a bag. Yeah. He he like had a confront, like a not a real confrontation, but like a small little like jab at at Cat at Jones, 
and he and he had his bag and yeah. then they showed him walking then walking outside between the normal outside and the red forest outside and he's like walking away yeah. cool guys walking away from explosions <laughs> but he's not he's not leaving the show i mean i, I would suspect that he, in either next week or the week after we're gonna check in on ramsey <laughs> i bet he's gonna be gone for a couple of episodes and then suddenly he's going to show up at the nick of time to help save somebody. Well, that would that would be par for the course. But yeah, I I, I, think, <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't have a sense of what the next arc is going to be. Other than oh that. no, yeah. But but yeah, I mean I I, I think uh, I think everyone's still on the board in a big way, except obviously uh, Doctor Eckland. I believe his name is uh, yes, Doctor Eckland. Jones R.I.P. Yeah, and and so I think the the I mean obviously there were a lot of like big events in terms of Ramsey. You know, just the whole the whole deal with Ramsey. But uh, I think the the big changes are going to be involved with Cassie, who is now seemed very troubled by the fact that the witness can embody her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say Jones, because she has now lost her uh, her former in an alternate timeline love. And and now (laughs) is uh, is is who knows what she's going to do about that. Well, and she's seen the power of her own technology, not only with it killing Eklund, but also with Sam being gone. She definitely feels remorse for both of those things. That is not is not solely focused on Eklund. She definitely, oh my God, Barbara Sukua, by the way, her performance when yeah. she when she was really like dealing with that, it was very subtle and very. Very wonderful. Very well done. I love the writing of that goodbye scene. Um, not to reference Star Wars twice in the span of five minutes, but it <laughs> very much felt like the Han Solo being frozen, uh, his dialogue with Princess Leia, where she doesn't give in and give him like the I love you. Uh, she says, I don't love you. And yeah. He's, he's like, you did love me. <laughs> it's, like, just like, great, it's like, it's like that, that felt so much truer to those two characters. Like he was 100% chill to the end. Like no, no one has been more chill on this show than that dude. <laughs> and My- she's, she is completely harsh and won't even give in in the moment of his disintegration. And <laughs> he just takes it in stride. <laughs> I love well, cause- that. Well, he knew that they were lovers once upon a time, and he yeah. can accept he can accept saving her despite her, her current state, <laughs> right, <laughs> which is she, something kind of nice. But but, but she was trying to sort of get him out of that. Like, don't make this sacrifice for me. I don't even love you. Like, this is not you're not being like you're not being heroic. Even though I don't think she believed that, but she's trying to save him. You know, right. she said that I think out of care for him, knowing that they were lovers. In a, in a timeline that no longer exists, but it exists to him. Um, and he just, he just, you know, sort of giving voice to that idea that like in this sort of multiple time stream world, that the time streams that don't factor in to, to sort of reality uh, as we know it are still like significant, you know, to, yeah. on an individual basis, if not on a major story, big story basis. Yes. Um, so there was something interesting that happened in Cassie being trapped in the house. I'm not sure how to even describe that. Being trapped in her own head, locked in a room. Um, yeah, that right. she looked out the window and we saw buildings. Uh, we saw like a factory. We saw a nuclear plant, perhaps, that had the word Titan on it. Yes. Which is very interesting. That, I think, is probably our best hint at where the second half of this season is going to go. Yes. That we have uh, uh, some kind of hint at something existing during the Red Forest. Some kind of something. <laughs> you know, some kind of construction has taken place. Some kind of company, I'm assuming, <laughs> exists. Yes. I, you know what? I am all in on a, so we had a plague story. I am all in on a radioactive aftermath story as well. Um, right. I, you know, all the things that cause horrible apocalypses, uh, I'm okay if we we just check them off box by box yeah. going through. <laughs> if the future where the Red Forest lives is because of some horrible nuclear accident. <laughs> yeah. And but, but I wanted to double back to something that we talked about yeah. last week, which yeah. is which is the connection between the plague and the army of the 12 monkeys and why the witness would have engineered the plague. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what it might be, and I don't take credit for this as an original thought, although I'll probably butcher whatever the original thought was. <laughs> but um, the the idea that um, he, the witness needed time travel to be invented 
And the way to facilitate that would be to wipe out 90% of the population, which is what, of course, sparked Jones to, uh, to develop time oh, travel. Oh, oh. So the concept he, – he created the plague and unleashed the plague in order to facilitate the invention of time travel, which I think is becoming more and more apparent or at least hinted at that that's what started this entire thing. That the t- invention of time travel is why we have this this notion of time as a living entity and why we have the witness and why we have the concept – the idea that time is something that's destructible all happened because time travel was invented. And so the witness you know, in, in some time stream needed that to happen, which is why the plague happened. That, this is one of those things where I get caught up in a loop of like, but when was the original – like when did the witness originally be created? You know? Yeah, no, like, there's no I mean there's no answer for that. There's it's you know, it's all <laughs> it's all it's all in the wind. You know, it's it's all right. it's all in the shifting sands of time. Right. Um, I still don't have I still couldn't explain exactly how time travel works on this show. Um so I don't know if I'll ever have an answer to that. But I just think like in broad strokes, the idea that the 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 uh, the, the the utility of the plague was to was to create time travel was yes. basically the the idea the details could be filled in by the viewer but, <laughs> or or more likely late in the show's run by some character giving exposition right although you know what we failed to mention we were talking about um about Jones and her realizing the gravity of what she's done with the creation of time travel yeah. uh, we 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 talked about these horrible monsters but we didn't talk about <laughs> the fact that she made these horrible monsters. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's pretty upsetting. Yeah. Well, now Jones is confronted with that and confronted with the idea that she has zapped out of her ex- existence, her own love, her own love story. She found happiness and can't even remember it. Yeah. You know, oh. it doesn't, e- doesn't even exist in the time stream that as it currently stands. And that between that and being confronted with that knowledge and losing Sam and everything just kind of going bad like that. I just wonder what Jones is going to be up to the rest of the season. Because yeah. that's a tough, <laughs> tough blow for her. Yeah. There's no way that she's the witness. Um, no. But, but I, w- I wonder what kind of epic – something epic is going to happen with well, her. Well, we could so- find out – again, if, if, if it's true that time travel started all of this, it could end up that Jones is the sort of accidental big bad of all of this. That oh. she was the – she's the catalyst for everything. That everything happened because Jones invented time travel and that that sort of unlocked all of this. And that that would be, I think, a um, a real like sort of sort of piling on the realizations for her that out of all this, like her her drive to fix the past actually ended up destroying the world. Yeah, that would be a great direction for the show just because I do think I've said this before I'll say it again I think that Barbara Sukura is definitely the best performer on the show um not that I mean literally almost everybody on the show is great yeah on their own right but she's definitely my favorite performance um but that would just be one of the saddest stories yeah I think I, I mean I want I want that because I want her to be at the center of everything. You know, I want her to, yeah. her to be just at the middle of what's happening. I think she's always been peripherally at the center. Like she's not quite center. She's just like left or right of center here and there. Um, but I think she, she's been this constant that I don't know that everybody would call her like the protagonist or the main character of the show. But I certainly think I, I like the, the, there's so much. We talked about this last week about like how much, of, of her characterization has been built up and how much we know about her and about the world that she came from. And now we know about this past, this love that she had in an alternate timeline and all that stuff. And, and we know things as we, we talked about with like Ramsey and Cassie too, but we just know we have such a rich, full understanding of her that I don't know if people necessarily automatically can tell that the show is very much about her. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, the main characters of the show are always going to be Cassie and Cole, but, but what I like with an episode like this is how unclear, how, how blurry those lines get where, you know, Cassie's been, been overtaken and Cole's got to rescue her, but he's, he's doing it with sort of everyone's help. And then, you know, the story with Jones and all, like, th- the show can be very, um, can v- very much spread out uh, everyone's roles so that it's not always just the Cassie and Cole show. Right. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that is, is very commendable about 12 Monkeys is how, uh, 
how all the characters sort of get their time to shine. And it, it you know, even, even when we get into a, like, a, a string of, like, Cassie and Cole travel in time to fight crime, um, I think the show is very mindful about not just becoming that and every other character is is surrounding them and sort of just contributing to their story. It's very much like we get stories with all the characters. We never spend too long with just those two sort of gallivanting about time. Like it, it doesn't it, – it never became that show, which before 12 Monkeys ever aired is the kind of show I guess it would have been, which right. is you have your two main characters and you sort of send them on time adventures. You know, and, and, and everyone else, there's other cast members and they have their own B stories and all that. But it's very much about those two characters. But 12 Monkeys has, has become something much more deep and confusing and mysterious than that. And is, is, is way, way messier than that sort of very clean, ready for TV premise. Which honestly is probably why the ratings aren't so great. Is that the show is much more challenging than it needs to be. And I think that that's what probably the best quality about it that it really it doesn't just settle for the easy answers and being more like procedural but it also that's also like there's a reason procedural television is is the most popular means is that people get very challenged and get frustrated by the sort of confusion inherent in telling a more complicated story and it's probably why the show is is sort of a a niche uh a niche show at this point as opposed to a sort of mainstream show Yes, no, absolutely. I think people came looking for a new Doctor Who and yes. um, they they got something much more enriched. Um, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Doctor Who fans. They kind of, they basically got lost um in terms of just the sort of the 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 guiding principle on which the show operates. Like not not comparing any like the plot elements or whatever, but just in terms of like a show that trusts that you will enjoy being confounded. Yeah, it's it's the spiritual. A lot of people have called it um, the spiritual successor to Battlestar Galactica in that way too. Um, in in terms for in in the Battlestar Galactica way, it's in terms of the technology that we create sometimes maybe should not have been created. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's probably at the midpoint between those two. It yeah. lost in Battlestar Galactica. It's sort of applying the lost um, sentiment and and frame of of sort of storytelling mind. To Battlestar Galactica, more in terms of setting and in terms of theme. Yes. Um, and sort of, sort of, kind of the midpoint between those two. Yes. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed Meltdown, and um, it reminded me so much of the season one episode where they went and and they they got the piece of the of the time machine from the the science the, the medical plant. I don't remember the name of that episode, but it probably oh. would have been around the same time, I imagine actually, um in the season, probably mm-hmm. like 7 uh, 7 or 8. Um so I I'm very much a fan of these <laughs> this sort of mid-season episodes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, this was very much a mid-season episode. Um but that's not a bad thing. And and 12 Monkeys does those very well. It has a has a way of making them feel important, and, and you know, even though I, again, even though I, this never to me felt like a paradigm shifting episode. It was still like, I th- I suspect that in the coming weeks they're all going to be built upon what happened with Sam in this episode, and what happened with Jones and Doctor Eckland, and uh, just sort of this. This I think was our kind of our change of course episode that we are now maybe the uh, the primaries are going to take a bit of a backseat here. Um, at least in terms of like the sort of them being the A story where we are traveling back in time and dealing with messengers and all of that. Now we're off to find the witness. <laughs> yeah, off to find the witness. That's right. <laughs> Figure out what's going on there. <laughs> I, I just want to – before we go, I, I don't feel like I hit hard enough how cool the body horror of this <laughs> of, of this episode was. Like seeing the weird time monsters <laughs> was – Super freaky and weird, and I just love that the show is like a horror movie now. <laughs> like, uh, no, I loved it so much. Right? It, it was so unexpected, um, in a really good way. Like the like it, as we talked about this season, just being like the horror season in a lot of ways. Like it went there, and it, it unabashedly went there. There were there were like and. 
entrails and guts and yeah. like and, and and everything disgusting you could think of of a human being being mushed together. Like the art department, the, the special yeah. effects department did like a great job. Like that was true actual body horror. You don't see that all the time. And and also Cole's face uh, was hilarious when he was like, "Those could have been me." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, Cole wasn't super pleased. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think he was very pleased about pretty much anything that happened in this episode. No, not not Cole's best uh, best feelings for the during this episode, um, especially when Ramsey was about to shoot Cassie. Yes, uh, uh, I did like. I loved that Deacon was like, "Well, uh, he's not going to shoot her, and I can't shoot her, so it's got to be you." Got to be you. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's kind of a blow to the the burgeoning Deacon Cassie romance. Oh. Is that Deacon was like, uh, "Yo, you better go shoot her." <laughs> <laughs> but he said, I know that I can't do it, but I also know that you, your kid can't get killed. Like, he he knew yeah. it was the right thing. It's oh. not that Deacon was being a jerk to her. It was just... No, Deacon was being very pragmatic <laughs> and, and, and is, is, as usual, the only character with, the, with like, his head screwed on straight, like, completely. <laughs> um, but, but all I'm saying that for romance purposes, Cole was the one who couldn't pull the trigger. Deacon... Uh, Maybe not pulling the trigger himself, but was more than happy to send uh, send a hitman to do it. Yes. So is- uh, yeah, I don't. I something tells me um, something tells me we're losing Deacon this season. Oh no! I no. Think, I think Deacon is a is uh, in a few not not you know not coming right up, but I suspect that he might be our end of season heroic sacrifice. As Doctor Eckland was a heroic sacrifice here. Um, I just I feel like Deacon kind of has to die for Cole and Cassie's love to uh, to live because I I you know it's not like they have to go in that direction but it just kind of seems like we're gonna get there. <laughs> I don't I don't want to let go of the Scav King. I love him so I, much. I love the Scav King too. And, and <laughs> if the show becomes like a Mad Max style, he and Cassie just roaming the wastelands gathering scrap, uh, Scav King and Scav Queen. <laughs> listen, I, I'll go I'll go on that ride. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but but I don't think that's where we're headed. <laughs> no, I know, but I don't know that we're necessarily losing him either. I'm I'm we hoping I'm hoping there's an in between. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, sure. although you know, if he did have to do the ultimate sacrifice, I'm sure that Todd Stashwick will do it with grace. <laughs> oh, he's the greatest. Every line is great. He's so good. All right, this wraps up our 18th episode of the Twelve Monkeys podcast. Before we go, I want to mention a few things. You can download and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and Libsyn. You can also hear all of our podcasts at our website, southgatemediagroup.com. Please subscribe to the show and also rate us. Check out my new podcast, Professional Geek Podcast, a show about how to be a professional and also a geek. And follow Kyle on TV Binges to read all about everything you love about TV. Follow the show on Twitter at 12 Monkeys Pod and Kyle and I at Kyle Loves TV and at Blair Loves TV. Remember, both Kyle and Blair have an E at the end. Thank you again for tuning in and we'll see you next time.